it, it's funny because it's like it's like your closest friends and your family are like the ones that are like well save your money like yeah. like and then you know you kind of have ha- kind of have to be a little bit hard headed at times and like say no I'm not going to listen to you here I'm going to just do what kind of my gut or my instinct is telling me to do and I think you know you really if you give it all if you give your passion you can't lose because you know what I, the worst you can do is learn. All right, guys, welcome to another episode of The Report. Today, I got someone who played in the NBA G League. His brother is an NBA all-star for the Philadelphia 76ers. My man is doing real estate development here in Southern California. I got Terry Harris. Terry, welcome to the show, my man. Man, Rich, appreciate you having me, man. Yeah, man, yes, I, pre- I appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to come down. Um, I was a big fan of your brother uh, yeah. when he played it for the Clippers. I was a big Clipper fan, but uh, your brother's out there killing it. And uh, I had no idea that, that you were investing in real estate until I got introduced to you, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been ev- investing uh, since I've been playing in the NBA G League. So yeah, uh, it's been life changing and I'm just happy to be here to share my story. You know? Yeah, man. You got a, definitely a, a <clears throat> unique story. Mm-hmm. Um, it's funny. We were talking before we started recording. It's like, you know, being in the real estate industry, we think like everyone and their mom is investing in real estate. But if you really look at it, it's such a small percentage of the population that's really doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you look at it in that perspective or that light, it's just uh, it's a unique thing, especially with your your background. For sure. For sure. Yeah, man. So uh, tell me, like, what were you doing? Um, you know, obviously you played hoops. Uh, Where do you play college ball? And, and tell me a little bit about the basketball early on. Mm-hmm. So I played college ball at Eastern Michigan in North Carolina A&T. Uh, after that, I had the opportunity to uh, play professional. So, um, you know, through that, I was getting ready for the NBA draft. I got to work out for nine NBA teams, and uh, I played summer league with the Philadelphia 76ers. From then, I signed with the Sixers and got waved down to the G League, the Delaware Blue Coats. And uh, an NBA G League salary, it's, it's, you know, it's a grind. Uh, NBA G League is a grind. So it's like you don't know what's going to happen. Everyone's fighting for a, a, 10-way, a 10-day contract mm-hmm. or a two-way contract. You know, everybody wants to get on the big team. So uh, it's a grind. It's a six month season. And uh, during that whole season, I was always wondering, like, how am I going to be? How am I going to get paid? You know, the next six months out of the year. You know, I love basketball, but I also got to make a living for myself. And, uh, you know, with that being said, I was just I've just found real estate. And I picked up, uh, I believe, the blue book by Brandon Turner, Mm -hmm. uh, the book on rental property investing. And uh, ever since I read that book, you know during the season, before, after practice, before games, listening to the podcast, I just knew that real estate was going to be that key for uh, me to receive financial income, you know, throughout the whole year and not have to worry about, you know, what basketball was going to do for me financially. What does an NBA G League player make? NBA G League, typical typical NBA G League salary is $35,000 for six months. Now, it's it's not your, you know, it's not the average 35 because they do give you housing. They do kind of pay for food here, you know. But um, and it is for six months. So um, if you have a 10 day, if you have a, a two way contract, you are paid a bit more or some guys, there's a couple of guys on the team who can sign an exhibit 10 to get paid more as well. But majority of the NBA G League players do get paid 35K. And so everyone's trying to get the 10 day. Um, what do you what kind of bonus do you get for getting a 10 day? A ten, I believe a 10 day when I was playing was around uh, 100K. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just for the 10 days? Just for the 10 days, yeah. Wow. Yeah, so yeah. 35000 for an entire six-month season in the G League. Yeah. Or one hundred k just to do a 10-day 10, a 10 NBA contract. Exactly. Where it might not even be long-term. Exactly. So you wow. know what type, you know how guys are fighting. You yeah. You know that 10-day. Yeah. Absolutely. Sure. And so when a guy does a 10-day contract, do they typically, ex, ex, if, like, let's say you play really well those 10 days that you're up, do they typically extend you another 10 days or will they actually sign you for the rest of the season if you play well? majority of the times it's usually just 10 day if you play exceptionally well you might get it you probably will get another 10 day and then if you do well again and you have the opportunity getting signed or looked at or might even be get picked up by another team right Mm -hmm. because if it's not with that team the tape is out on you and you could get picked up by another squad is there a a longer contract other than 10 day or it's just 10 day and then a full year oh there's a 10 day there's a two-way which is also like what is that a two way is uh, an NBA team will sign you to a two way, but and you have like you you're with the big team, you're with the NBA team, but you're also going down to the G League team when you're not playing, and then like you're like a you're like a project player mm-hmm. really. You're like you you're prepping in the G League, but then you're also with the NBA team as well. So you're going back and forth, and that salary is around three hundred k. 
And that's for an entire season? That's for an entire season. Okay. Right. So yeah. they can call you down or call you up as many times as they mm-hmm. want. Yep. And why would a team uh, sign a two-way? What's the benefit for the team? I believe every team has about two to three two-ways that they get. So they'll, you know, every team will have, you know, three players that will go back and forth from the NBA and the G League team. It's just part of the whole salary cap. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What's, what was the transition like for you? I mean, playing college ball and then you're up playing summer league. Was that your first NBA experience with summer league going into the, yeah. the Sixers? What was that, that kind of step up in competition like? Huge, huge. Uh, but mainly it was just a mental, it was, a, it was just a mentally, it's just a different game. Um, I think when you're playing on that pro level, you know, you're, every guys are bringing it uh, every single day. Uh, you know, you're playing against every guy who was the man in their college team. So now you're playing with everyone who's the man and it's just it's just mentally you're going to have to be on that next that next edge and that next level and to train and get there was like uh it was one of the toughest summers i've ever had as an athlete and um uh, most challenging but um you know the reward is there if you know if you do the right thing yeah mm-hmm. what's the training like um when you're in the g league or you're you're playing summer ball does these teams have like nutritionists and all this stuff dialed in for you guys? For sure. So nutritionists, uh, weight programs, uh, you know, your body fat has to be a certain percentage all the time. Um, if you're not playing, you know, you have to be getting conditioning. You have to be doing extra workouts. Um, you know, everything is like everything is uh, statistically uh, backed and you're, you know, all the stats are backed by, you know, just how much reps you're getting in and uh, how much shots you're getting in. It's really intense. I, I follow that guy, Chris Brickley, oh, yeah, uh, the yeah, yeah. trainer out mm-hmm. of uh, New York. Is there a lot of value of going and, and doing, you know, structured programs with someone like Chris Brickley? Oh, for sure. For yeah. sure. I would, uh, my summer, I would share Chris Johnson okay. out in LA. And um, one of the things, you know, Chris would also, Chris Johnson would make sure our workouts were catered to the NBA level. So one is like, we're training for NBA, NBA type of game. And then another thing, another thing that was so great was every day we're competing with NBA caliber guys. So doing that every day, knowing what the NBA workouts were supposed to be like, only just prepared me in the, the right way for either workouts, games, G League, whatever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you made the pivot relatively early um, over to real estate because, you know, with, with your skill set, you know, a lot of guys go overseas and mm-hmm. you can probably make pretty strong money. Uh, overseas, did you have opportunities to go out there and, and sign contracts? I did. So when I started to get into real estate, it was right before COVID. Okay. So I was, um, I happened to uh, buy a home while I was in the G League for $170,000. I put, I did FHA 3% down. Um, I had, I think I had to bring to the closing table about like six grand. But like I, I negotiated some seller credits and uh, I was able to get a credit of $10,000 back. So I was able to go to the closing table with his six grand cashier's check and leave with a 10 grand check and the keys. Mm. And uh, I remember um, I just saved everything up from the G League. I, um, I maxed out some credit cards. I put $30,000 into the house. And this is all during COVID. And about a year later, I was able to sell that same home for 320 grand. Wow. So for me to be one foot in, one foot out of real estate, and 3x my G League salary from one real estate deal, I was like, oh, you know, this might be something that I might need to take a little bit more serious. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, I, I was doing both. I was juggling both for about a year and a half to two years. Uh, when COVID happened, overseas markets were just shut down. And um, I, w- I got a couple offers to play overseas. And at the time, I started a wholesaling business and uh, I was still flipping houses. And it was just, it just didn't make sense financially to uh to kind of pause what i had going on and to go overseas so i was like look you know the best i mean the best way i can do is a max contract in the nba um it, you know if if, if if god given it that happens so i was like i'm turning that down so real estate's gonna have to do that for me one day or another yeah for it to be you know but uh I, i'm you know i'm still i'm happy with the decision i made it, i do miss playing ball but, uh, you know, I enjoy, I enjoy creating, creating, you know, developing and, uh, um, you know, being my own boss. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How much can a NBA G League player, a typical G League player make overseas? I know some guys, typically the guys who are making seven figures overseas were, were NBA guys that were already solidified, mm-hmm. you know, already played a couple of years in the NBA. Uh, majority guys probably probably making overseas from the G League, um, like six figures, 100, yeah. 200, 100, 200K. 
you know, some some guys a little bit less. Um, but yeah, the overseas, you know, from the people I know, it is a grind. You know, it's a your, grind. Your story is very similar to uh, reminds me of Ryan Pineda's story. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, playing you know minor league baseball for many yeah. years with the grind. And then flipping couches on the side Mm -hmm. uh, and getting into real estate flipping and just kind of going all in on that and walking away from the baseball. But uh, look what he's been able to to build in in such a short amount of time. And he talks about all the time, like um, how, you know, you can play sports for only so long, no matter who you are. But, you know, what what we're doing, entrepreneurship and business and real estate investing, it's like Mm -hmm. there's not really a shelf life for that, you know. And so you're getting a head start from a lot of those guys that are going to be playing 15, 20 years and then trying to figure out what that second chapter is. You're starting that right now, exactly. you know, and that's mm-hmm. a huge leg up that I think a lot of people don't talk about. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, tell me, you know, you, you read the blue book, Brandon Turner. Mm-hmm. Um, you bought that, that deal out East and, and sold it, made a nice return. What was the first like investment type of real estate after that? Uh, the next investment was another home. You know, I said, all right, I made this money, time to put it somewhere else, you know, put it back to what, what gave you the money. So uh, I was doing training in Los Angeles and um, I found another opportunity in Joshua Tree for a home. I spent about $230,000 and it was about a year later. So I was able to do another 3% down. So I did that and I, um, I put about 65 grand into it. So I was all in close to about 300 grand on that home. And at the time it was as Airbnb, averaging about six thousand dollars a month, and uh, cash flowing close to four grand a month, and I was like, "Ooh, you know, a couple of these would be really nice." Yeah, and um, you know that 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 was my that was my entry into one a new market and uh, Airbnb, mm-hmm. and um, you know another a year later, I was able to sell that same property for four hundred and forty thousand dollars. Wow. So another, you know, another great return on investment and, uh, and it was doing so much, doing very well in different ways, you know, from short term renting and from, you know, the equity that was created through it. So that, that, that was the next asset I, I was able to purchase. And yeah. Mm-hmm. And now you're, um, you know, you're doing these development deals, you're raising private capital. Um, how did the development deals come to fruition? Mm-hmm. So at first, um, as, as I was, uh, you know, flipping houses, I also created a wholesaling business and what was so good about the wholesaling business is that it required no money up front. It just required a lot of work. And, um, I was able to learn how to source deals for other developers and investors. So majority of the wholesale deals I would do were land deals and there were land deals in Joshua tree. And, uh, typically I would make on average around nine, 10 grand per, per wholesale deal. And, you know, at my peak or prime, I was doing, uh, about three to four a month. So it was, it was like, it was like, Oh, this is like really solid, you know, solid mm-hmm. income. And, um, and I, you know, it was, it was a good way to learn how to find deals. And it was a good way for me to, uh, shadow investor, uh, shadow developers and see, okay, what, what price are you buying land for? What are you doing with the land and how much you're making from these land deals? And, uh, there was one developer that I was watching and, um, he was telling me, okay, I'm going to build this property for about 400 grand. I'm looking to sell it for mid 800 grand. And, so I was like, so you're looking to make $400,000 profit for one deal? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, oh. Then I kind of like backtracked and said, okay, I'm making 10 grand off this one wholesale deal. But if I'm able to kind of do what he's doing, <laughs> I'm able to make way more on one deal. So, you know, the financial part was so cool. It was, I mean, the financial part was pretty solid on that. And then to develop was also really kind of, it was really cool for me to see like a process of seeing plans, being creative with something. And seeing going from the ground up, so I knew that once I had enough capital and liquid, I wanted to go and buy a couple parcels of land out there, and um, I was able to buy two parcels of land and start developing. And one thing led to another. I was able to show other developers what I was doing, and and you know build partnerships. And today, now we're doing about twelve single family luxury single family houses out there in Joshua Tree. Wow, I love mm-hmm. that. Um, so. Run me through the numbers behind like a uh, a typical deal out there in Joshua Tree in the luxury space. What are you guys buying the land for, and then how long does it typically take to get the uh, permits to to start your build? If you are a busy professional and don't have time to invest in real estate, but still want to participate in the passive income and tax benefits, my team Summers Capital is buying a lot of boutique hotels right now. We source the deals. We renovate the properties and we even do all the day-to-day management, making it truly hands-off for our investors. If you want to learn more to see if we can help you, go to summerscapital.com slash invest. 
to book a call with our team. Again, that's summerscapital.com slash invest. Now back to the show. For sure. So one of our deals, we bought our land for about $22,000. Uh, it costed about, roughly around $25,000 to pre-develop it. That's architect plans, that's structural engineers, that's all the site tests that are needed and plan submittal fees with the city, about 25 grand. So all in roughly about 50 grand. And then from there, we use that money as equity for our construction loan. So we'll go and get a construction loan. And what the construction lender will do, they'll go and appraise the drawings that we have from our architect. And they'll give us roughly around 60% loan to value on, the, um, on, on what the property would be worth if it was built today. Mm -hmm. So for instance, one of our luxury houses just got appraised for 1.05 million, so a million and 50,000. So they're giving us $600,000 to build out the whole project. Um, and it costs from our con for our contractors about $550,000 to build this whole thing out. So what we'll end up doing also is we'll put months, about six to eight months of prepaid interest payments inside the construction loan just so we're at a lower investment money out of pocket. And, you know, throughout the, it'll take about six to eight months to build and it'll take about three to four months to get these plans pre-approved uh, approved by the city. So overall, like about, I would say about 12 to 14 months uh, throughout the whole process. And uh, usually our exit strategies are number one to Airbnb them and then two to sell. So I like to have two different exit strategies just so I'm not forced to sell it. And if we do sell it, we're selling it at the price that we want to sell it for. And then um, in Joshua Tree, we're building, we're building houses. So we're building our product that we're hitting the Airbnb, Airbnb market is not just uh, a mid or a low class product, but it's one of the best products that you can get out in that market. So uh, with luxury homes, with pools, uh, beautiful amenities, and it's just um, a great stay for anybody who's looking to go out in the desert and have a vacation. Yeah, I've seen these uh, luxury homes that you're building on your your Instagram. Mm -hmm. uh, they're gorgeous. They're yeah, immaculate. Uh, just the design or like, is like everything is to the T. Mm -hmm. um, and I encourage all the listeners to go up and follow Terry at Terry Harris fifteen. But, you know, for someone that's developing out there in Joshua Tree or maybe it's a different market, how do you know what bedroom size and like square footage you should you should ideally build to? Mm -hmm. So what I do is um, I speak to a lot of property management, property management companies. Uh, one of my buddies, I believe you talked to him earlier today, actually, uh, Patrick, uh -huh, he owns yep. a property management company. And just, you know, this is something that anybody can do. And, um, you know, I speak to them and I ask them, you know, what properties are performing the highest? Mm -hmm. What are performing? What, why are they performing the highest? And then, uh, it, you know, you can do that. I, um, I use air DNA data to uh, see, okay, well, which ones are performing in the price range of what we're looking to make? And, uh, you know, you, when you analyze a whole bunch of properties, you'll find out what's common between those that are making um, in, in Joshua Tree over $200,000 versus the ones that are making less than $100,000. And those things will be quite evident, whether it be a pool, a hot tub or bedroom count, how many people can host the views and, uh, you know, just just doing a bit of due diligence and understanding your market. I think that's huge in any market that you get into to just do that due diligence. So I, I take it I take it upon myself to do really extensive due diligence to know exactly what's needed to make sure that product is a high end product that is going to get um, the numbers that we're looking to get. If you guys sell these properties, I know your your first look or your option is always to uh, refi and keep and operate as an STR. But if you were to sell, is that next buyer almost always going to be a short term rental investor? Most likely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Most likely, these homes are catered for short term rentals. So, uh, but they are they do have the home feel to them. Mm -hmm. You never know; somebody could be really interested and say, "Hey, this is beautiful. I'm in love with it. I want to live out here." Um, that could happen, but. I think I personally think it's probably 70, 30. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I've still yet to uh, visit Joshua Tree. I, I hear a lot of great things about oh, it, but I, I don't know if I would live out there, man. It's a no, little yeah. out there for me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I make my trips up and back there, you know? Yeah, same day. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. Um, and so now you're doing, uh, in addition to the luxury homes out there uh, in Joshua Tree, you're building out apartment communities, apartment complexes. Um, Tell me a little bit about like how that came to fruition because that's mm -hmm. that's kind of a big pivot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you know, in Joshua Tree, I was maneuvering through many different cities out there: Landers, Yucca Valley, and Joshua Tree, and uh, those are different planning departments. So as I started like learn, learning the commonality between you know maneuvering through each planning department, 
uh, I just thought I had the confidence to go into any market, you know, and to develop in any market. So um, I live in Los Angeles and I saw LA as a huge opportunity as lack of supply and a huge amount of demand out there for housing. And um, just from speaking to a lot of developers out there, seeing what they were doing for deals, um, I was like, this is, this, is, this is my next step. It's not just single family development, multifamily development. And uh, I do like to stay creative in all my development. So I wanted to come in as a, a developer that was not just your average developer, cookie cutter box apartment, but mm -hmm. something that's more curated to uh, the audience or the customer who's trying to live in Los Angeles. So through that, we are looking to develop a, a 27 unit apartment complex and a 42 unit apartment complex, both revolved around communal living with, with uh, space, with good functionality and just a building that's, uh, you know, the people who live there will have pride behind living in this building. So I'm excited for that. I know LA is a, a bit, you know, a strange process to get through planning, but, yeah. you know, I think, you know, going through multiple planning departments like I did in the last two, three years, I think I'm able to maneuver through them as, through there as well. Yeah. I love mm -hmm. that. So with these new build, uh, apartment, uh, buildings, are you tailoring to more of that luxury class A type of uh, resident or mm -hmm. are you more, uh, more of a workforce housing type of price point? I would say about, you know, B plus A, A, okay. A. Yep. Mm -hmm. I love that. Just in areas that are, areas that are have momentum growing and i just want to i don't want to reinvent the wheel and go in an area where i think is going to be growing but an area that's already growing mm -hmm. and i think that's what's worked in joshua tree it was an area that we saw momentum and growth coming and and we just added we added something that that was needed in that market so same thing in la there's markets that we're looking at that have that growth and we're just trying to trying to just add to the growth there yeah um, with those particular deals, I know there's multiple exit strategies. Um, you know, you can sell once you have the permits and, and it's shovel ready to a buyer that's want to come in and pay a premium and they want to do all the work. Um, or you can, uh, do the lease up phase and then sell, mm -hmm. uh, or you can lease up refinance and, and keep long term and, and look for a big exit down the road. Um, for you guys, I'm sure, you know, you're going to have all these at your disposal, but what is the number one option going in? I think the number one option is buy and hold. Okay. Buy and hold. LA just, I mean, California in general just has a history of appreciation, uh, rent increasing. So if rent increases, that means our building property value increases. Uh, you know, so we'll go and build them out, uh, refinance them, and just, you know, cash flow a bit. And, you know, year by year, we'll just bank on the appreciation. And uh, I think that's, that's the number one goal with all our real estate assets that we acquire. Is just uh, to, to appreciate, and uh, you know, if that price comes in, the price is mm -hmm. the right price. You know, yeah, by all means. <laughs> right. What does lending look like in that space? I know you mentioned, you know, out in Joshua Tree with the luxury homes, the lenders will give you sixty percent of the ARV. Uh, what does that kind of look like on on this side? Mm -hmm. So we're like looking at about seventy percent uh, loan to cost, and that's that's cost for for the construction. It'll be seventy percent loan to cost. And we're kind of looking to go non-recourse on these loans. So making sure myself and my investors aren't um, held accountable, but it's just, it's yep. a non-recourse loan. And 70% um, 70, 70 loan to cost, that means that the cost of our land, our financing costs, and our costs of the construction costs, along with the soft costs, we'll gather all those, all those together. We'll get 70% of that as the, the loan to build out our, our apartment building. I love the the non recourse uh, product, and, and for the listeners out there, um, you have recourse and non recourse. Um, multifamily is one of the only asset classes I believe. Mobile home parks will do it as well, mm -hmm. um, to where they the lenders will lend uh, non recourse. Meaning, if you did default on the loan for whatever reason, they're not going to come after your personal uh, assets. Um, and the reason they do it for those two asset classes is because those are probably from a risk. Uh, an adjusted risk standpoint, um, they're, they're probably have the lowest default rates out of any asset classes out there to lend on. Um, so it is unique. And I think that's always the way to go. I always say, if you can get the non-recourse, do it, yeah, you know, sure. um, we do hospitality and, and they don't, unfortunately they don't have non-recourse product for that mm -hmm. asset class. But, um, I do have some non-recourse loans right now for some of the multifamily stuff. It's a great product. Yeah. Not that I plan on ever defaulting, you know yeah, what I mean? Exactly. But it's just nice, you know, it is for sure. Um, and so did you, with these development deals out in Los Angeles, did you partner with folks? Tell me about like kind of what the team looks like. Mm -hmm. So right now the team is just, uh, it's honestly me, my brother, 
wise that we talked about earlier yeah, and, and a couple other athletes who are just looking to transition from, you know, basketball like myself and to into the real estate game. So, um, you know, I believe they see my, tr they see my track record in, in real estate and they kind of, they like the trajectory where we're going in towards. And, uh, we all feel like ownership and real estate is just a great, just a great avenue to get into. And, uh, also to create something special like we're trying to do here, uh, is, is, is something that's very enticing. So, um, and we feel strong about the market and where the market's going to take us in the future. So, um, that's, that's kind of where we're at right now with that. Do you, so you mentioned your brother Tobias is, is investing and in, in getting into real estate. Do you have other, um, whether it's like college teammates or G league teammates that see what you're doing and they're like, yo, Terry, like I want to, I want to get involved too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit particular with my partners though. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, just like early, selective. Yeah, just early on. Uh, it's funny because, uh, when, uh, I was uh when I when I was on the bus to the, to the games in the G League, I used to I used to just read in the back of my my real estate books, and, you know, mm -hmm. and you know we joke around all the time. But guys would be like, "Yo, look at this guy's reading," and, <laughs> and uh, one of my teammates was like, he always messages me. He's like, "Dang, bro, I was really making fun of you," <laughs> and so it's just it's funny to see that now. Like, and they always like, "Man, man, like, well, when can I invest? When can we get in? Or when can we get in on something?" And it's it, it's funny, but uh, we always laugh and joke around, but. I think one day we'll all like, you know, everybody will all, you know, start coming together and doing things together. But yeah. uh, as of now, I kind of, you know, just, just kind of keep it, keep it kind of close in there right now as, as we're yeah. growing. And uh, it's funny, know. it's funny you say that because I feel like whenever we get into any new thing in life, any new walk of life, like at first people kind of like laugh at it, you out you and they won't take you seriously. But then, you know, you, you made it when people start coming out and asking you how to do it. Exactly. Right. Exactly. It's anything new in life. Exactly. It's funny how it's that super works. Funny, yeah. Yeah. So, so what's next for you as you kind of look out over the next six to 12 months and any big real estate goals for you? Um, I guess really it's finishing up a lot of these houses right now. I have four under construction right now. Uh, my goal in the next six, six to 12 months is to finish those four. I have about another four that are in planning and that we want to get those going as well. And um, I believe in the next 12 months, I, we have already submitted the plans for our first apartment building into the LA city building department. So next 12 months, we want that those to be approved and to start breaking ground on that. And, um, we want to create a brand and a, a brand and a, um, a behind our living space. And we want to really encapsulate this vision that we have. Uh, we've, we've thoroughly like selected a really good team of architects together, a good team of engineers, contractors that are, that are all working together to, to, to really build this thing together. Um, so we want to get that together and, um, I think we do want to acquire about two to three more, two to three more, um, development deal, multifamily development deals in LA, uh, that are based around the same type of communal living that we're, that we are creating. Yeah. And speaking of, you know, kind of setting up your team, whether it's contractors or architects, um, I've had some shitty architects kind of, uh, over the last couple of years, um, curious, like you know, for someone that wants to go out and, and start developing uh, or do heavy renovations, what do you think is the best method to find the right contractors? Sure. Uh, for architects, I want, if anyone new, I think get a architect that's a local architect, if you're new, who knows the local planning department. So the, the reason I say that is they know how to maneuver throughout that planning department. They're not going to get as many corrections mm. as uh, as somebody who's never gone, uh, never submitted plans in that market. Um, so I think that's huge, and that say, that can save a lot of time for you. And uh, also, somebody who's local is going to refer you to other good local resources. So when I first used my a local architect, he gave me uh, local engineers, uh, local surveyor, and you know the the cost of their prices were also very much cheaper, and they just know the area really well. And uh, then the way they know how to engineer can save you a lot more money as well, as far as using somebody from out of, you know, out of, uh, out of town or mm -hmm. whatever. So developing in the desert is different from developing in LA. The yeah. engineering is just two completely different things. And then I would say the next thing is get an architect who can encapsulate the vision that you want. I know a lot of guys, they want to build a nice modern home, but they're using an architect who is building regular, you know, regular stick build, uh, custom, not even custom home cookie cutter homes. Yep. And, and he's not, he doesn't have that same vision as you. So I, I suggest getting the architect who's built the home that you really like 
finding that architect. If you see a home that you really like and you want to develop it, you know, do a little research and find that architect and use that, use that one kind of that's in line with your same vision. Yeah. I'm very inspired with, you know, everything that you've built in, in a relatively short amount of time for someone out there that was, you know, maybe they're in another career, maybe it's not basketball, but maybe they're in another career and uh, they're trying to get to where you are. What would mm-hmm. you say the number one key to success is? Hey guys, real quick, the only way this podcast grows is if you guys share it and review the show. So if you do find value, if you could take two seconds and drop a five star on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, it would mean the world to me. But more importantly, it will help us reach new audiences and help more people build wealth through real estate investing. I would say go for it. You know, like you're never, I don't think you're ever going to know every little thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, Even to this day, there's hiccups from the biggest and the best developers. Like they go through little trial and errors. And these are things that, you know, they, they couldn't plan for. So it's, it's, it's part of the game. And what I'm learning every day now and developing is just, it's about maneuvering. It's about problem solving. So, you know, understanding that, that that is a part of the game is, you know, if you understand that, just go for it, you know, you know, embrace the hiccups, embrace the journey. Um, and my, my biggest thing to anybody is just, just, just to go for it really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think, um, early on it's always challenging because that's when, you're going to hear all the the noise from friends, family members that they're going to be quick to point out all the risks that you can get into, all the reasons you shouldn't do it. Um, and unfortunately, I think a lot of those folks uh, take a lot of that, the consideration a little bit too heavy and it, it talks them out of, you know, pursuing their dream in real estate investing. Um, so I know for me personally, um, you know, when I first cashed out my 401k to, to go do my first deal, um, coworkers, friends, even, even some family members were like, hey, like, are you sure you want to do this? I'm fortunate enough that I did not listen to a lot of those folks, which got me to where I'm at today. But, you know, I think it's always different little steps along the way. It's like, for me, it was like cashing out the 401k. It's like, oh, it let me do it. And then once I did, I'm like, oh, that's not that bad. And then you find, buy the first deal and you're like, oh, this actually works. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, it gives you a little bit more confidence. And then you do another deal and it gives you more confidence. And now I look back and like, I'm sure you feel the same way. Like looking back at some of the things that you did early on where you were like, man, is this really going to work? Now you're like, dude, like that's not a big deal because I've already been there. Exactly. Yeah. Hundred percent. I remember, like, it's it, it's funny because it's like it's like your closest friends and your family are like the ones that are like, whoa, save your money, like, yeah. like, and then you know you kind of have ha- kind of have to be a little bit hard headed at times and like say, no, I'm not going to listen to you here. I'm going to just do what kind of my gut or my instinct is telling me to do. And I think, you know, you really if you give it all, if you give your passion, you can't lose because you know what. I, the worst you can do is learn. So mm-hmm. uh, I'm all for it. Just go after it and just, you know, learn. And, and that, uh, what I love about real estate is like, you're going to mess up, but you're going to learn. And if you hold the asset long enough, you're going to make money off. It. Yeah. I, I think a lot of people are, um, when they jump into something new, they're, they're so afraid to make a mistake. But in all reality, like you alluded to, we either win or, or, or we learn. Mm-hmm. And dude, I've, I mean, I just turned 38. I'm like this last year I've learned more lessons than I did the previous 37 mm. because I'm out there taking action. And because of that, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm failing every day. I'm making so many mistakes, but like, um, I'm able to learn from every single one of them. And so next time I see a certain situation, I'm like, okay, I'm going to be that much better, mm-hmm. you know? And I think that's the, that's the one thing that, you know, when anyone's new trying to do something, uh, that might be new to them needs to realize it's like, dude, you don't need to be perfect in all reality. Like the more mistakes you make, the better you're going to get. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Did you have a, a, a mentor starting out when you got into real estate? No, you know, uh, you know, one thing I learned when I was uh, playing ball, it was make connections while you have the jersey on. So what was good about that was I was able to uh, speak to like uh, local, like the local city people who were like mm-hmm. just really supportive of like of, of, of our team and everything. And they would give me so much good advice. And I, I would just tell them straight up, like, hey, I'm trying to buy something out here. I want to I want to get into real estate like. How's this address? And they were so open to say, hey, you might not want to develop there, but or, or hey, you know, go pick somewhere else uh, and do this, do X, do Y, you know, use this contract. And like, so there were just so many resources that that are just out there. And then I, I know I was playing there at the time, but even in different markets, you know, people are really what I've learned is like people want to help, you know, and when they see you or when they see someone with uh, a passion who wants to uh really learn and grow in something, you know, a lot of people just want to be open and help. So, you know, I took that and I, 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 I use as many resources and just, just learned. I kind of, most of my mentors really came from, um, really came from podcasts, uh, 
books and uh those were really like majority of the things i really learned from yeah i i love that you said you went out and reached out to local folks in the area and i think in this space especially real estate investing Mm -hmm. 99 percent of the folks that i I know in this space are so helpful and they want others to win like genuinely Mm -hmm. um i get personally almost more joy out of seeing others that are like behind me win versus myself at this Mm -hmm. point and um you know i think uh, a lot of folks that were maybe old school mentality 30, 40 years ago, there was a lot more scarcity mindset out there because it was like, hey, I got this piece of knowledge. I have a competitive advantage and I'm not going to share my secrets with anyone else. I want to yeah. keep this to myself. You think it was more like that back in the day? I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because if you look at our parents' generation or our grandparents' generation, they, you know, and this is kind of a, if you study demographics, mm-hmm. there's a book out there called, um, what was it called? Great, Big Shifts Ahead. I forget the name of the author, but I interviewed him on my old podcast, my old apartment investing podcast back in the day. But he labeled all the different generations based on what decade they were born. Mm. And he said the folks that were born in the 40s, he called them the the savers because they saw their they grew up seeing their parents get rocked by the Great Depression of the 1930s. Mm. And so he labeled them the savers. And so if you think about the folks that my parents were, were born in the 40s they kind of come from that scarcity mindset. It's like they get a little bit of money and they want to hold on to it. They get Mm -hmm. a little bit of knowledge and they want to hold on to it. They don't want to share it because they think that it can be gone tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And um, I think in today's generation, it's like the opposite is true. Mm -hmm. Like how to win today is the give first mentality. And I 100% believe that. Mm -hmm. If you look at the people that are growing the fastest right now, if you look at the people that are making the most moves in business or real estate investing, those are the ones that have the give first mentality. You know? the mm-hmm. Alex Ramoses of the world, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I think, you know, you'll lose a little bit by, by having that mentality, but I think big picture you're deferring and you're leveraging, uh, for the future. Sure. No, no, I you agree. Know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, dude, I appreciate you, you coming on the show, man. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a big fan of everything you're doing and I'm truly inspired by, um, all the knowledge, uh, and savviness that, that you have in the real estate game in such a, a short amount of time and I'm excited to follow along your journey. Man, I appreciate you having me. This was really dope. And, uh, Thank you again. Yeah, man. Mm -hmm. Likewise, we'll have to stay connected and um, I'm excited, brother. Listeners, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you in the next one. Peace.